and you act out uh, aspects of that spirit's personality. Sleep had to be included in this because when you ask people, when you go into cultures and say, have you ever had these kinds of experiences, or have you ever heard of someone, they tell you stories that sound like dreams and nightmares sometimes. And this is actually what I studied as part of my dissertation work, hypnagogic imagery. And I've actually seen in Dennis's work on the mosquito and the greasy sickness that some of them have this sense of what he's describing as possession by the devil as a hypnagogic hallucination, which is something we experience as we're falling asleep, you feel paralyzed, you think you're being assaulted. Very common in many cultures. But it's not always distinguished from these other things in terms of what's causing this. Um, so I'm moving from one end of this to the other end, we're really going to be looking at trance and possession trance. And the continuum, in a sense, you can see there's greater ritualization as you move across, greater mobility as you move across, uh, symbolic elaboration uh, on one end, and tends to be more in amnesia as you move across. Ultraviolet syndromes, muck, optic hysteria, tache de nervios I've mentioned. Uh, you've probably heard of some of these things. Um, Things are always running amok with this university. Uh, Attaque de Nervios is one, and these are all listed in the uh, DSM, is one that uh, I'm kind of drawing from here. It's, it's primarily seen in the Caribbean. We talked about this earlier, certain Caribbean zone. And it's uh, also primarily experienced among women, but not exclusively. And it's associated with traumatic events, deaths, other problems in the family. And it is a kind of a screaming fit. Uh, you see that funerals a lot. and it's it uh, ends in a kind of a falling out. And in fact, that's what it's called in the African-American community in the United States. In the Southeast, there's a similar uh, phenomenon. It's something that I think is the final endpoint of what's going on in Honduras. And it's a little bit like that with greasy sickness as well. Susto is, in, uh, just to be um, clear on this, is, is part of a larger kind of group of, or taxa of um, Spirit, it's soul loss and spirit illness um, diseases that are recognized in a lot of cultures. So they scare you, and that shock does something to you. Your soul is loosed for a moment, and once that happens once, you can that can happen again. And the triggers can make you lose your soul again and again. So this idea of susto is at the heart of nervousness and the inability to kind of control emotions. Um, the spirit catches you and you fall down. That's an example of this soul loss, if any of you have read that, where the, the young daughter is scared by the slamming door and she has a convulsion, a real epileptic convulsion, and then they have to figure out what happened. Um, but it's the same idea. The, the Hmong culture considers it uh, a, a sign of shamanism and, and that you will be a good shaman, whereas our culture wanted to put her on meds and they had to struggle. The idea that these syndromes are culture-bound is, is coming into question quite a bit. And I think Rhoda Halpert has really made a major contribution to discussing some of this in terms of uh, class and gender, I think, too. And pointing out that in our society, we don't have to exoticize these as much. They occur in our society, too, uh, in certain forms. The idea of somatization of psychiatric distress, for example. And it shouldn't, probably, shouldn't be exclusively a cultural uh, descriptor. One of the ways of putting altered states of consciousness together, when you think about the different ones around, uh, the different societies around the globe, you can kind of group them. And there are a couple of these. The fright illness taxon, which I've discussed, the sleep paralysis taxon, you know, so the old hag syndrome, the nightmare. The word nightmare in English, if you look at its etymology, refers to a creature that comes and, and, and oppresses you at night. The word in Spanish, pesadilla, oppressive being. Um, those are all part of sleep paralysis taxon. It's a running taxon, this is greasy sickness. Uh, Startle matching taxon, lata is the, the typical one. If I clap my hands and any of you had lata, you might start spewing expletives, um, which is what kids will do to people they think are lata to try to get them so they can all laugh at them. <laughs> are these illnesses? I don't know. They, are, they can be grouped, they are addressed a little bit in the DSM. When you have this, you may have a DSM disorder, you may not. Uh, so there is, it's a separate constellation of symptoms. They're organized a little bit differently. They're much vaguer symptom clusters than you find in DSM, which are much more specific. And very quickly, I think I've said a few things about these already in terms of the metaphors, but uh, Charcot and hysteria, and you know, here's a, a picture of Charcot who's considered to be the father of neurology looking at a brain. It's a, not a picture, it's a drawing, of course. And 
but I think it's classic because it really kind of shows this shift in thinking about different moral and humoral ways of, of explaining what was going on in uh, a lot of the women that he was seeing and that others were seeing in uh, the prisons that, and the, the hospitals that were set up after the French Revolution, where a lot of people had left, been left homeless and these kinds of things. We're now looking not at uh, the effects of magnetism and humors and spirits, but at lesions in the brain. And it's this point, Charcot will begin to kind of look for these things inside the body. And so it's a key moment in that sense. Freud was a student of his. He kind of takes this and really psychologizes it completely. It becomes a psychodynamic kind of thing in that we convert some kind of emotional stress, which we just really can't accommodate, into, a, into an embodied idiom or a somatic idiom, like paralysis or blindness, which we'll call hysterical paralysis, hysterical blindness, kind of drawing on that language of hysteria. And then Genet, who's also a student of Charcot's and a colleague, I think, of Freud's for some time, he was uh, a little bit more interested, he's kind of associated with this idea of dissociation, um, where trauma is involved. And it really, uh, that there are mechanisms, cognitive mechanisms, that help us deal with trauma. And it may be something like a, dissoci a dissociation of parts of consciousness uh, that get partitioned away so that we don't have to face you know, the reality of, say, our father raping us as a young child, because it just doesn't make sense that that person who cares for me would do that. And, and you, can't, you can't hold it all together. So the idea of dissociation is you got to get it out of consciousness for a while. But it triggers a male's voice of a certain kind. They go into a altered state of consciousness. Closet land was a movie years ago that I think portrayed that pretty well. I don't have any pictures of the, the Honduran situation, but this is a famous painting of Charcot. And gives you a little bit of sense of the, um, the environment of the time. You know, all these men evoking a hypnotic uh, trance in a woman and studying it and discussing it and, and they could be easily invoked. They learned as part of their studies of hypnosis too. This was very similar to hypnosis and that you were very suggestible when you're in this state as well. And this is how psychiatrists treat them. You're going to start being able to move your hands. You're going to start being able to etc. etc. And you suggest people and it's generally how it goes. And to kind of pull the background together, social production of symptoms, I think this is what I want to try to point out with sociosomatic distress. Um, the idea that distress is experienced and communicated through a somatic idiom, um, and that emotions are a major part of this, and feelings and cognitive, cognitive constructions linking person, action, and soci sociological milieu uh, give these things some of their, their power and strength. And there are also aspects of moral and ideological attitudes, and I think in this sense they're idiomatic and they can be seen as kinds of forms of protest, if you will. So, the two communities that uh, we're talking about are pretty much set at the same tropical latitude in Central America, um, but they have very different uh, social and, and natural ecologies. Um, the Honduran community sits uh, off the river Coco on another tributary of the river there, and is a community that was um, displaced for a while and sent to refugee camps in Honduras in the uh, 90s. Um, that same conflict affected the communities that are in a much more mountainous area of Honduras here. Um, and I think we can, you know, we'll see some more of the differences between these two communities, but they were both affected by uh, the conflict in the 80s there. Uh, in a more, you know, ethno-historical or, eth you know, just ethnic background of the area, these were some of the tribes, and this is kind of a, a you know, sketchy labeling of some of the indigenous tribes in the area. Uh, Lenca is uh, the, the group that is closest to the group in Honduras, and the Sumo is another name for Mayanga, and these are the northern uh, Mayanga that we're talking about, the northern Sumo. So let's go to, let's go to Honduras and um, look at this mountainous area, get a little sense of the landscape. There's a couple dots on there that I'm going to show you pictures from, and that arrow points at a uh, volcano in El Salvador. You're at the you're at on top of one of these hills and looking into these cloud forests, which certain times of the year it's just it's every day it's like this. You get rain at night, the sun comes out the next morning, the, the valleys are full of clouds, and as the day goes on, it kind of burns off. And you know, depending on the time of year, it could also be very brown out there. This is obviously during the rainy season. At altitude, you're kind of pine forest at this tropical latitude, and it's about six thousand feet. It's pretty cold at night. People are lined up for the doctor's visits here. Um, and dressed well. Uh, you don't you change your underwear when you go to doctors. Um, Honduras background. Um, 
few things that I think that maybe you haven't already told you, Misty.